As we have all heard many times, no doubt, the unemployment rate <laughs> for adults on the spectrum is uh, somewhere between 75 and 85 percent, a figure that anecdotally resonates with my research. So it's really great to be able to learn a little bit more about these diverse approaches to uh, tackling this fairly significant issue. Um, so <laughs> in the next 15 or so minutes, I'll uh, try to give a very brief uh, overview of my dissertation research, focusing on big picture findings rather than uh, the minutia. Uh, and as an anthropologist, I'll present cultural patterns that I've recognized through, through my research. So that's, that's the form it'll take. Um, and following this, I'll switch directions and speak a bit about my role as the lead facilitator of Ascend's Autism Job Club. I know we have one menu member in the back of the room, maybe, maybe a few more scattered throughout, uh, which is an all-volunteer group that meets the second Saturday of every month, as Michael said, uh, at the ARC, which is uh, 1500 Howard Street, if you're interested, uh, in the Soma District of San Francisco. At the end, I'll briefly share some of the projects that the job club is exploring and new directions that we're thinking about going in. And I heartily welcome your feedback and uh, impressions in terms of how we can best go forward. So uh, some of you in the room might be asking, what is a medical anthropologist and what's he doing on a panel? Uh, and I, no way I can answer that question in five minutes, but I will really quickly uh, throw a lot of words at you and hopefully a few of them land. And if they don't, you can come find me afterwards and maybe I'll do a better job. Uh, for many people, anthropology evokes images of archeologists digging in uh, the remains of distant civilizations or forensic clinicians examining crime scenes for faint traces of an elusive criminal. Uh, I'm very sorry to report that I do neither of those things and that my uh, branch of anthropology is rather uh, a subfield of cultural anthropology, uh, which is a field science that systematically investigates the effect, impact, and structure of social and cultural phenomena or factors on human lives. We look at things like belief, myth, forms of classification, community, communicative norms, social rules, and ritual practices. Uh, a ritual practice, for instance, could be a job interview. So we look at how a practice like that is constructed and the underlying beliefs that go into its, uh, its, its performance. Um, in the early years of this discipline, most people investigated uh, so-called primitive tribes. So we'd show up in a canoe in Papua New Guinea and uh, invite ourselves to spend two years with the natives and try to learn everything we could about their culture. Now we don't do that so much. Some people still do it, I, I don't. Uh, but I apply the same sort of method, the same sort of holistic uh, attention to uh, autism in the United States and globally. Uh, so just to give an example, um, some might recognize, what I'm doing is vaguely analogous to what Margaret Mead, that's a name that some people are familiar with, did with marriage practices in Samoa which is to say, trying to understand how deep-seated cultural uh, systems are influencing the pursuit of individual lives. Pragmatically, this means that my research has largely involved participant observation, a technical term that basically means just hanging out or <laughs> watching people do their thing, uh, or in the words of one of my colleagues, uh, deep chilling, uh, and also a lot of interviews. So I've done a couple hundred interviews for this project. Um, and then, you know, I, uh, I will attend events like the United Nations has an autism day every year. Uh, I was a camp counselor for a group called Tech Kids Unlimited in New York that teaches adolescents and young adults on the spectrum digital design and coding skills and a, a way to try to prepare them for the workforce. Um, and also interview folks, maybe some of you have heard of SAP's Autism at Work program. So interview folks there. And uh, I've been on an all autistic meditation retreat. So I've tried to be pretty uh, expansive in my, uh, in my procedures. So with all of that uh, preliminary stuff out of the way, let me try to say very quickly what I found in, in doing all of these things for two years. Big picture, the heterogeneity of the autism spectrum 
has created a lot of confusion and bottlenecks at pretty much every level of the field. So we heard a little bit earlier from Bonnie about uh, regional centers eligibility practice and how just having a autism spectrum condition diagnosis might not be sufficient for eligibility. And we've also heard that sometimes you need to sort of merge diagnoses. So that's one way, a very concrete, practical way that this heterogeneity, this diversity of the autism spectrum, the oft heard adage that if you've met one person on the autism spectrum, you've met one person on the autism spectrum. Well, this also impacts employment. And one concrete way that this impacts employment is that employers will sometimes draw on pop cultural perceptions of autism as savant-like and expect an autistic candidate to present their, their special skill or their savant skill. And when a person has uh, maybe doesn't have that skill, very few of us, autistic or otherwise, have savant skills, the employer will be disappointed. So that's one concrete way that a culture is um, sort of shaping the employment experiences of adults on the spectrum. Um, likewise, the politicization of autism, uh, some people call it the autism wars, that's creating uh, a lot of debate about where funding should go and whether certain forms of autism are really autism and all of these things that I'm sure everyone in the room is too, too readily familiar with. Switching from autism as the focus for a minute, one thing that we've, uh, well, I've learned in this is just how central work is to American culture. Uh, it's not true across the world in all cultures. Our identities as adults, as mature, independent, fully human social creatures is really wrapped up in, in this culture and being a worker. And a worker not just who does something that contributes but that brings in money. So there's a, there's a certain pressure I've, I've learned in our culture to have someone flourish in a 40 hour a week job. And for many folks, that's a very realistic and admirable ambition, but it's not, it's not realistic for everyone. So there's a bit of tension that emerges around that. Um, and I can, happy to circulate the longer, more uh, <laughs> loquacious version of this if you have uh, any interest. But, so that's the big picture finding on autism in American culture. Now, employment. Um, there's a few things that are more specific to employment. One is that we find again and again that autistic adults are excluded from the workplace on the basis of this very, very nebulous notion of culture fit. So they'll, I can think of a couple examples of folks who have PhDs who are incredibly talented and who are going on dozens of interviews and being rejected from everyone. And the thing that they're told again and again is that there just wasn't the culture fit. So culture in this case is a way to basically exclude folks on the spectrum. And um, the reasons for that are, are in part because our, our culture values the workplace as it's sort of primary social environment, and it's perceived that somehow that uh, folks on the spectrum are not gonna be able to fit in. And that that's, uh, that's really, I think, a tragedy, but that's something that I've, I've seen again and again. Uh, as I'm sure everyone in this room knows, interviewing is a process that could not be more biased against folks on the spectrum. It's really not about providing the correct answers, it's about doing it in a way that feels spontaneous and loose, and it's really actually sort of a theatrical performance when it comes down to it, where you have to present yourself as both competent and a dude that, you know, would go, go get beers and burgers or whatever it is that the, the business does. So it's, it's a very delicate social performance that is, uh, it's not particularly rational necessarily, and it's not particularly clear, and the, the, the process is itself, I think, uh, unfairly biased. Uh, next, across the board, what we've seen, or what I've seen, I don't know why I keep saying we, it's just me, uh, poor understanding of what accommodations means for folks on the spectrum. Again, this loops back to the heterogeneity piece. Um, if someone who has uh, deafness or someone who's blind asks for accommodations, there's a very specific set of accommodations that are expected. When someone on the spectrum is asking for accommodations, maybe it involves sensory issues, maybe it involves very clear management directives, maybe it involves something else, but because the autism spectrum is so diverse, there's not a, a, a very crystalline conception of what an autistic accommodation means. And what happens often for folks who do wind up getting a job is that the managers will find the accommodation request 
just personality flaw. They'll say, why are you making such a big deal about, you know, the light, fluorescent light? Can't you just get along? And that's in part because people don't understand that sensory issues are really integral to autism. People's understanding of autism is savant genius who maybe is quirky socially. And since the idea of sensory uh, impairments or sensitivities is not built into the, the standardized definition of the diagnosis, there's confusion there as well. Um, there's also, and this is the last thing I'll say before I turn to the job club, there's this myth of the quality assurance expert. <laughs> and there's some truth to this, um, but the idea that autistic people are immune to boredom, ha are many of you familiar with this quality assurance trope? So there's basically this idea that people on the autism spectrum are perfect employees for boring, detailed, repetitive work because their repetitive <laughs> Uh, and fixed interests, which is one of the, the criteria of autism, uh, allow them to flourish in doing things that other people would find boring. So this is an idea that sort of infiltrated the corporate world, and now there's all of these hiring initiatives amongst Ernst & Young, Microsoft, SAP, various others, that are trying to place autistic people in detailed, boring work, quality assurance work. And um, I'm sad to report <laughs> that most folks on the spectrum are, are as prone to boredom as, as anyone else. So while on the one hand, it's fantastic that uh, the corporate world is looking to hire autistic people, and maybe this myth, again, culture, is, having, uh, is influencing them, impacting their, uh, their decision to do so. When they find that their employee who's on the spectrum does actually get bored doing boring things, they're almost so, oh, well, you know, well, if that's what it is, if it's just another disability thing, let's throw the baby out with the, you know. So that's, that's, uh, that's an unfortunate thing that I've seen. There's a lot more that I've seen, and I'd be happy to share more of it, but those are some of the big, big picture findings and give a, a kind of a sense of what I've, I've learned. So now let's turn to the Autism Job Club real quickly. It's a, a project of Ascend, which is one of the oldest autism groups in the United States. I believe it was uh, founded in 1997. The job club itself is a lot younger. It's about four years old, meets once a month, and it's broken into two parts. The first part, we have a speaker, uh, either someone from Department of Rehabilitation. Uh, we've had a lot of diversity and inclusion officers from big tech companies. We've had people from Google and uh, Salesforce and, and the like. The next three months are, uh, just to do a little plug, uh, this month we have someone from Airbnb, next month we have someone from LinkedIn, and the following month we have someone from Pinterest. So these are people who are responsible for diversity hiring. And it's, uh, it could be a good opportunity to interface with, uh, with the folks who might either be running autism hiring programs or thinking about hiring, starting autism hiring programs. And it can be a backdoor into sort of circumventing a recruiter. Uh, and then the following piece we work with folks one-on-one -on, -one on LinkedIn skills, uh, interviewing skills. We have a recruiter who works on this culture fit stuff with uh, members, and also uh, workplace social skills. So how to manage a conflict with a manager, for instance. Um, the things that we've seen again and again in the job club, the issues that come up and we address most frequently are the question of disclosure, whether or not to disclose a diagnosis, either with a manager or during the interviewing process, Networking, not the easiest thing for a lot of folks on the spectrum, so how to make it something that's not unbearable. and It's not true for everyone, but just working on networking skills, um, asking for accommodations and explaining to managers why you need them, uh, coworker relationships, some career change, <laughs> and uh, also managing expectations, um, which can mean a lot of different things. So uh, I'll end by just saying that uh, our in the pipeline for the job club, we'd love to add a transition track. Most of our members are in their mid-20s, if not older, some are in their 70s. Um, and so we've sort of uh, neglected folks who are in the age range that I think CIP is so wonderfully addressing and ongoing process. So if any of you have uh, thoughts about how we could work with this population, I'd, I'd welcome them. We're also thinking about trying to create an accommodations workshop for employers so that rather than have to deal with this over and over again, we as an organization could present some sort of workshop that would 
give employers a better sense of what accommodations for someone on the spectrum uh, entail. And then we are also thinking about maybe trying to develop some sort of autism hiring program hub, but that's, that's very inchoate and that's in for me.